How odd we are, we Christians, to call Good Friday good. And yet, this is the day we remember that Jesus was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Please be seated. Our first hymn this morning is O Sacred Head, Soul Wounded.
Please be seated. Welcome this morning. Thank you for joining us in person for this Good Friday service here at Scots Church in Melbourne. And welcome to those who are with us online via YouTube live streaming. It's good to have you with us too. If you are new to Scots, please take a moment to introduce yourself on the card that you'll find under your seat. You may have been passed one on the way in. And we would love you to take a copy of our free magazine, The Leaflet. There is no morning tea after the service today, but we would love you to come back and join us on Easter Sunday for our regular 11am and 5pm services. Just a reminder too that tonight we're presenting the St John Passion, some fantastic music here from 7.30pm sharp tonight. Uh, can I encourage you to please ignore, if you're a driving person, ignore the sign that says car park closed, as I hope you did this morning. Uh, we can validate your parking tickets if you're here for any of our Good Friday events. Let's join now in singing the great Easter hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather this Good Friday, we remember your Son Jesus Christ and what he did when he went to the cross. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our disobedience, beaten so we could be made whole, whipped, so we could be healed. We remember the words that he spoke as he hung on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When we look to the cross, we see forgiveness poured out on all those who turn to your son in faith, who see in his 
suffering the innocent suffering of a servant king. Lord, you know our hearts. We find the forgiveness of past hurts challenging. We have been wounded by others. We want vengeance. And yet, you have forgiven us of the greater debt. So help us this morning to look to Jesus as he was lifted up on the cross, that we may have eternal life. And so we pray together now that prayer Jesus taught us, praying for your kingdom, praying for the power to forgive as we have been forgiven, praying for the honour of your name in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This morning's first Bible reading is Luke 23, 13 to 25. You can follow along in your order of service. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time, he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found him in no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided, that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. Amen. This morning's second Bible reading continues in Luke chapter 23, verse 26 to 38. You can follow along in your order of service. And as they led Jesus away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, What will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Amen.
This morning's third Bible reading continues in Luke 23, 39 to 49. One of the criminals who were hanged with him railed at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light faded, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was righteous. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts, and all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Amen, and thanks be to God. Tell me if this story sounds familiar. An alleged insurrectionist charged for his part in a violent uprising in the nation's capital, rightly or wrongly declared innocent, largely because of the fear of the strident voice of the people calling for his freedom. I guess one man's insurrectionist is another's freedom fighter, depending on which side you're on all a question of perspective and yet arguably a turning point in history as a judicial decision endorsing sedition and violence sows the seeds of the undoing of a nation and a radical inflection point for Western civilization. Now, of course, being Good Friday, I'm not talking about American politics, even though the contours sound familiar. I'm talking about Barabbas in Luke chapter 23. He's one of the key bit part players in this well-worn story of betrayal and denial, of cowardly power sacrificing justice by bowing to the loudest voices while other voices, it seems, are almost silenced. We're going to listen in on some of those voices this morning, hear firsthand from both sides. First, the collective voices of the Jerusalem crowd. A crowd made up, we're told, of the chief priests and the rulers and the people themselves. They've brought Jesus to Roman Governor Pontius Pilate on a charge of misleading the people, calling with one voice, it seems, for the release of Barabbas, in prison on that charge of insurrection in the city and murder. A charge well established. This guy is bad to the bone. Militaristic, murderous, determined to overthrow the established Roman order. The other Gospels fill in a detail. At Passover time, it's traditional to release a prisoner of the people's choice, give a presidential pardon. And so here they are calling with one voice 
against Jesus. Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man thrown in prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. We vote for violence. Now, Governor Pilate, we're told, wants to release Jesus, convinced that he's innocent. He hasn't been misleading the people at all. But the crowds keep shouting, kill him, nail him up, crucify this Jesus. And they are so urgent about it, their voice is so loud, that Governor Pilate caves in under the pressure. The vox populi, the voice of the people, prevails. Request granted. Verse 25 says he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. Barabbas is a free man. The key turns in the lock of his cell door. They give him back his few coins and his dagger. Back on the streets, people's choice and delivers Jesus over to their will. I don't know if you've ever watched the People's Choice Awards. It's an American TV tradition, a popular online vote to the best of everything in entertainment. Can I say respectfully that the fact that the Kardashians won reality show of the year is a sure sign that sometimes the voice of the people get it wrong. The loudest voices and a popular vote don't always make for the smartest decisions. So here we are. Barabbas, the guilty murderer, the insurrectionist declared innocent. Jesus, the innocent healer, delivered to their will, condemned. People's choice. Their voices prevailed chief priests, the rulers, the leading people of Jerusalem, uh, the Jesus movement safely extinguished. Now it's interesting to watch in the passage from this point on who speaks and who remains silent. Who joins in mocking and condemning him and who defends? Simon of Cyrene who silently, it seems, helps him carry the heavy crossbeam he's about to be nailed on. Others not named, a great multitude of the people following along, including a crowd of women who are mourning and lamenting for him. And then Jesus speaks to them. Don't cry for me. Cry for Jerusalem. Weep for the fact that they have chosen insurrection and murder over the path of healing and serving and salvation. A choice that doesn't end well for anyone who makes it. Never did. Look, that's the choice that's playing out around the cross in the words that are spoken as he's crucified too. In A remarkable contrast. Two criminals who are put to death with him, not named. They crucify all three, nails through their hands and their feet to the wooden beams, then stand them upright, three crosses, one of the criminals on his right, one on his left. Each, it seems, with a very different angle on what's going on. And the crowd's watching, mocking. You've got Israel's rulers scoffing at him. You've got the soldiers mocking him. (laughs) This is great fun. All with a common theme. He saved others, this miracle-working healer. How about he saves himself? Come on, chosen one, Christ of God. Down. Get down from the cross. Save yourself. Cheap shots, but loaded 
with irony. Then criminal number one chimes in on the same theme with an addition. It's in verse 39, if you're following in the order of service. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Save us too while you're at it. See, bitter, salty, sarcastic. In the Greek original, it's literally, he swore at him. Railed at him is our polite English version. Let me ask you, why so angry? Often these days, the same. Just take a look sometime at our Scots Church Facebook feed. Every time we advertise an event, such vitriol in the comments. Taking their cue, I think, from people like Richard Dawkins, who says... Religion makes specific claims which need to be ridiculed with contempt. Well, there's contempt, all right, loads of it. Scorn, ridicule of Jesus as he hangs there, declared innocent, dishonestly accused, unjustly condemned, only because of the chorus of voices. And now the criminal says, save yourself and us. Until at last there is one voice with the courage to challenge, to stand against the verdict of the crowd. At last there is one voice, it seems, with nothing left to lose and perhaps everything to gain. Criminal number two. He's looking at exactly the same scene as the other guy but from his angle he sees something entirely different. Watch how it plays out. The other one rebukes him and says, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He he looks at Jesus, he sees innocence. And more than that, astonishingly, he looks at Jesus and he sees a king. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Which, to be honest, must have looked astonishingly unlikely. Surrounded by that chorus of mocking, aren't you the anointed Christ? Aren't you meant to be the king of God's kingdom? And this one man, in spite of what everyone else is saying, tells his mate to shut up and then throws himself on the mercy of King Jesus. And Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. You won't be disappointed. And look, in fact, he's not the only one to get it right. Soldiers mocked him before. But suddenly now at noon, the sixth hour, the sun darkens. The whole scene in gloom, a huge rending sound from the temple as the giant curtain tears in two from top to bottom. Jesus calling out in a loud voice words of ultimate trust in his Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And suddenly silence. He's gone. And the centurion, commander of a hundred Roman soldiers, the man in charge of the execution squad who crucifies people for a living, this time there's something different. When he sees it unfolding, a change of heart, maybe a growing conviction through the events of the morning as he's been watching, he praises God and he says, surely this man was righteous. 
courageous statement when you think about it. We've been wrong. Which maybe now is dawning on the crowds as well because in verse 48, when the spectacle is over, they head for home and they're beating their breasts. Uh, Typically a sign of deep remorse. What have we done when we called for the death penalty? Too late now, it's over. And at the same time, his closest followers, we're told, are keeping their distance, watching. Now, very briefly, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been tracking through what various people have been saying in this well-known Easter story, full of dialogue. I want to close with a quick look back at what Jesus himself has been saying and ask the question, what if? What if his words give the true picture of what's happening? What if his words are the ones that take us to the essence of Easter? Back to verse 34, as they're crucifying him between two criminals, Jesus says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's a prayer, it's an astonishingly gracious prayer. So what if, just entertain the thought with me, what if God answers and says yes? What if, through the events of Easter, that prayer of Jesus is answered not just for the small bunch of people hurling abuse at him on Skull Hill. But what if it's a forgiveness that rebounds and echoes and spills out across the generations, even today? What if it's like a flood of potential forgiveness for anyone who wants it? That would be good, wouldn't it? If the shame and the mocking that he took could somehow in God's way of doing things absorb the shame that should have been on you and me. Next, Jesus says this to that second criminal who says to Jesus, remember me. Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. What if... He actually means that and he's got the power to deliver on it. So that not by that criminal's efforts to be religious, it's too late. Not because he's lived such a good life, because he didn't. Not because he's taken the sacraments in church, not because he's been pious, not because he's helped the poor, not because he's kept the Ten Commandments, He's a thief. Well, maybe nine of them. Jesus says, this is going to be your last day, but today you'll be with me in paradise. What if Jesus turns out to be right about everything and particularly for this guy beside him, right about that? I mean, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Finally, with his last breath, Jesus says this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What if the Father gently takes his spirit into his hands on that good Friday afternoon, only to hand it back again first thing Sunday morning in a resurrection? That would be really good, wouldn't it? And everything that's happened would suddenly turn upside down. The mockers eating their words. The nation of Israel, imagine this, looking to be led by a healing prince of peace rather than a Barabbas, a murdering insurrectionist. 
the judge being judged, Pilate's verdict overruled. More to the point, maybe your verdict as well. Now, friends, I don't know where you might stand. Every Easter on the TV news at night, they'll report on Good Friday church services and they'll say the faithful turned out in huge numbers to Easter services today. But it's not just the faithful, is it? It's the doubtful as well. It's the sceptical. It's the irritated husband on the one day of the year. It's the impatient family members roped in, only semi-willing. Maybe that's you. We've seen the people's choice. Crucify him. In the words of the hymn we're about to sing, a murderer they saved, the prince of life they slayed. So can I ask you on this Good Friday, what is your choice? Where is your voice in this story? But the even bigger question, what if he really is God's choice, ready to be vindicated by rising from the grave? Something you might like to ponder between now and Sunday morning. We've got the marchers singing outside. We're going to sing them... Uh, another song from here. We're going to close our service with a hymn that reflects on those great reversals of Easter. You'll see those words in verse 5. A murderer they save, the prince of life they slay, as God shows his love through the cross. Let's stand and sing.
Thanks for being with us this morning for this celebration of the good things of Good Friday. And please join us again tonight, 7.30, Sunday, 11 a.m. or 5 p.m. And now may the grace, mercy and peace that's ours through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ comfort us, keep us and encourage us today and every day. Amen. Amen.